Welcome to our third lecture on the topic of sexual harassment. Let's begin this lecture reviewing what we learned in our last lecture about the elements of a hostile work environment sexual harassment claim. You may recall that there are two types of harassment. We have quid pro quo, which is our traditional sexual harassment, where there's a, if you do X for me, I will do Y for you. If you want to sleep with me, I will promote you, or I will um, <clears throat> not uh, fire you, whatever the circumstances are. And then we have the hostile work environment. And in that last lecture, we talked about the six elements. In order for the plaintiff to successfully make a hostile work environment claim, a sexual harassment hostile work environment claim, he or she needs to allege that uh, the conduct was unwelcome to the victim, that it was based upon the victim's gender, that it created for the victim a hostile or abusive work environment, that it unreasonably interfered with the victim's ability to do his or her job, that it was sufficiently severe and or pervasive, and that it affected a term or condition of the victim's employment. If the plaintiff can prove those things, then he or she is on track to be successful in a hostile work environment sexual harassment claim. So at this point, we've completed our introduction to sexual harassment, and we've talked about the quid pro quo and hostile work environment theories of the case. Now we have some remaining topics to cover, but certainly this second one is where the bulk of the material relating to sexual harassment is. So let's talk about the topic of employer liability. Before we do that, though, I'm going to talk briefly about the love contract. Um, this is not something that I recommend clients consider doing, but it is something out there that sometimes uh, clients are interested in and that uh, needs, uh, I think it's important to be aware that this is out there. And this is a document that two individuals who work in the same uh, facility and who are romantically involved may, uh, with, with the leadership of their manager, decide to enter into. So we're going to talk briefly about how it works, what's involved, what its purpose is, and um, what its level of utility is. And this is the idea that a love contract, the, um, the individuals, they may be peers, they may be subordinate and superior, uh, that they sign a document acknowledging that the relationship is voluntarily entered into, that they understand they can end the relationship whenever they want to without any kind of retaliation, that they also, that the other person, that, that they understand the other person has the right to end the relationship and that there can't be any retaliation for having done so. Um, it, we use the term contract here, but it really isn't a contract. Um, it won't affect the employment at will status. And it's really an agreement between the two individuals in the relationship. So the word contract is uh, kind of used more artfully than literally. Um, it is intended to establish voluntariness and to reinforce uh, the, uh, the rules of the road in terms of consensual relationships. It also usually covers the complaint process that the company has that way the employees can't claim later on they didn't know what that policy looked like. Now, is a love contract going to somehow protect the employer against bad behavior by one of the participants? No, it won't. It's not a magic bullet. But when both parties are aware of the seriousness of the matter and understand what the company policy is, it may make that uh, bad behavior less likely to happen or it may cause the other person to immediately report the bad behavior. And so while it doesn't cure the problem, it perhaps reduces the likelihood of a problem developing. Is it worth the effort? Well, that's hard to say. Um, I think a better plan is, especially when, when the uh, individuals in the romantic relationship are within a reporting relationship, it's better to just say that's not a good uh, plan to have and one or the other person needs to be moved, or the relationship needs to be ended, or one of the parties needs to leave the organization. Um, if it's between peers, um, a love contract might be a possibility, 
I don't particularly care for the term love contract. Um, so I think perhaps just reinforcing the uh, policies within the organization is the better course of action. So um, uh, n by no means a full endorsement on my part for this idea, but it's something that uh, you need to be aware of in the event that you have a client that's interested in it. Let's consider how it can play out in a particular organization. So Mary works for this bank and she's involved with a romantic relationship with Bob, who is in a more senior position within the bank. Uh, they are, you know, happily involved in this relationship, but Bob is concerned that there could be some sexual harassment issues in the future. I would stop right here and say, Bob, are you in a relationship with somebody that you think this could end up this way? What are you doing that is causing this vibe, number one, or number two, why are you with somebody that you think might make up an allegation? Um, so I'm not sure that this is a, a recipe for a good relationship to begin with. Um, it would, the contract should restate the voluntary nature of the relationship. It should assure Mary that any decisions about her employment will not be influenced by the end of the relationship. And it also ought to document um, how the complaint process works in this particular organization. It also ought to have Bob uh, uh, be told that, you know, he needs to not retaliate if the relationship doesn't work out. Uh, so again, it, it is an approach to consider. Let's talk about how employers should respond to the possibility of a sexual harassment issue in the workplace. So let's consider the issue of liability. We've talked about the two theories, quid pro quo and hostile work environment. And those two theories have differing implications for employer liability. Now, if we have a tangible employment action, which is typically going to be the quid pro quo situation, then the employer is strictly liable. We've talked about this term being respondeat superior, We've talked about it being vicarious liability. Those are all synonyms for the idea of strictly liable. And so this means that there really is no way that the employer can avoid liability when a tangible job action is taken. This doesn't mean that a smart employer doesn't work uh, conscientiously to avoid sexual harassment under these circumstances. The, the ways that an employer can avoid it before the tangible job action happens can be having multiple levels of review and having that complaint process so that the employer is aware of the concern as early as possible when the concern develops. So if you have managers, for example, before they can terminate somebody, that it has to be approved by uh, somebody maybe outside that particular facility, um, that can be some protection against having a tangible job action that ultimately ends up being a quid pro quo situation. I'm going to let you know that the cat's paw doctrine is a real problem here because if you have somebody who wants to harass, let's say, we'll, we'll go back to example of Bob and Mary. Bob is a senior person. He wants to harass Mary because Mary has rejected him. And so he wants to terminate her employment, we'll say. Well, if Bob is conveying the information to somebody in another facility, hey, um, I want to fire Mary it's very likely Bob can present the facts in a compelling way that this person who is completely separated from the uh, unit will think, well, yes, we ought to fire Mary. Um, and so uh, the, the, um, the, the, the HR manager outside the facility obviously has no desire to retaliate or to harass Mary, but you know, it's a garbage in garbage out situation. Since this person is only hearing what Bob is telling him and Bob has an evil intention, it's very likely that Bob can persuade the HR manager to dismiss. Um, but there is some level of checking. I mean, after all, if Bob is completely inventing things, then the HR manager should say, well, show me when you covered that corrective with Mary, or show me her attendance records. And so there needs to be that level of review. Sometimes what happens in these situations is that Bob will say he's the unit manager, has a, a particularly good relationship with the HR manager. They deal with each other and, you know, 99 times out of 100, Bob has a pure motive. He's trying to just do the best job he can at his place of employment. And so what happens is the HR manager and the unit manager develop 
a rapport and the HR manager comes to trust the judgment of Bob or whomever is the, uh, the unit manager or the person in that responsibility. And so the HR manager may well not uh, rigorously check to make sure that every I is dotted, every T is crossed. And so it, it's important that the HR manager doesn't get too chummy with the unit managers and re retain some level of separation and some level of independent review. Uh, another way to uh, make sure that the tangible job action um, doesn't become an issue is to have people outside the unit regularly be in the unit uh, to get the tempo and the feel of the unit, to see what's permitted, how people are behaving with respect to one another, and to be available for that face-to-face -face concern if it comes up. Sometimes people are reluctant to have a conversation about something that personal with someone whom they haven't met before. And so having that connection can reduce the likelihood of that tangible job action actually happening and therefore avoiding that quid pro quo situation. Of course, the real time that the employer has the best chance to avoid liability is when we're looking at a hostile work environment situation, when there hasn't at least yet been any tangible job action. This is the time that the employer is best situated to avoid liability entirely. So while it's possible with tangible employment action, if you can stop the tangible employment action from happening, once it's happened, the employer is on the hook. There's just no two ways about it. But if there is no tangible job action that happens, that's when the employer is able to potentially avoid the strict liability, the respondent is superior, the vicarious liability outcome. And the method to do that is through the Farragher-Ellerth defense. Um, I know I actually, most people say Farragher-Ellerth, and I know I have the names the other way. You can certainly say Ellerth-Farragher, but for some reason, it doesn't fall, fall off the lips as easily. And so the secret to this um, type of defense, which is an affirmative defense, so the burden is on the employer, who is the defendant, to prove this particular defense. It's not on the, the burden is not on the plaintiff to disprove the existence of this defense. So there's really two steps. The first step is that the employer is going to have to prove that there was an effective prevention policy in place. And this usually has a few different elements to it. One element that's going to have is it's going to have a training element. And it's a best practice to train the uh, new employees ideally on their first day of employment, but certainly in their first week of employment, um, and to document that training to make sure that it happens, and to periodically remind uh, employees of that training. Uh, typically, this happens once a year. Um, it doesn't have to be once a year, but it kind of makes sense. And it's easy for thing, people to forget about it. You, know, you may have you know, a particular month in the year that, okay, this is sexual harassment training month, and you make sure you get everyone through that training at that point in time. And the other part is having some kind of complaint process. And of course, that's going to be an important part of your training to not only talk about what is sexual harassment, how to avoid it, but also to talk about what to do if you observe it or you're a victim of it. And so you need to make sure that's communicated effectively. The types of uh, communications that are the, the types of uh, complaint process you want to have are going to depend somewhat upon the facility but these are some minimums that you wanna have. You wanna have at least two paths that this person can go to to complain. Because if you say, well, simply go to your manager, what if the manager is the person harassing you? Or only go to HR, well, what if someone in HR is the person who's harassing you? So you need to have at least two paths. And typically the paths are through your chain of command, either your direct supervisor or manager, or the person above him or her. Also somebody in HR. Those are the two paths you definitely want to have, but some organizations have additional paths, and those are also good. In fact, they're better to have more than, than two paths. One path can be a 1-800 hotline, and many times this is actually run through a third-party organization, um, and so this, the employees will actually oftentimes have a higher level of comfort with this because they recognize that the person they're speaking to doesn't even work for the organization, actually has no investment in any of the people that you're going to be talking about. And so uh, it can be a process that is even, feels even more safe 
uh, typically the uh, employer hires this third party vendor to kind of run the program. And at the third party vendor location, usually it's kind of like a call center. And uh, the uh, employees there take calls, write down, you know, they have a set list of questions typically provided by uh, the, the company hiring them. And they, they take notes about what the employee says. And then that information is sent to a centralized person within the organization um, who would process that particular complaint. The outside organization typically doesn't process the complaint, although certainly you can probably set that up as well. Um, there can also be emails that employers send, excuse me, complaining employees send the information to. It is a good practice to also allow these to be anonymous. And of course, the 1-800 number is the best way to send anonymous complaints. Um, then of course, the, the third part, so you've, you've educated people about it, you've had a, an effective complaint process. The third part is to have an effective investigative process. And it's really important if you're gonna have this effective prevention policy to make sure that your investigation is very quick on the, uh, immediately after the complaint is lodged. Uh, you ought not wait longer than 24 hours, and, and really, you ought not wait 24 hours. Um, but, I mean, you know, if it's a weekend and you get the complaint on you know, Friday night at 8 p.m. and no one's working until Monday, that's fine. But if people who are involved in the situation are continuing to work at that time, then you really need to, to jump in within 24 hours for sure. You want to make sure that you're interviewing people uh, that are appropriate. Obviously the alleged victim, obviously the alleged harasser, but there probably will be additional people who are going to be interviewed. You want it to appear to be um, a complete investigation that doesn't assume there's a particular result that is being sought. And then you need to reach a conclusion and all this needs to happen pretty quickly. You don't wanna rush the conclusion. Sometimes there's legitimate reasons to delay it, such as someone's on vacation or somebody is off sick on a particular day or something along those lines. And so sometimes it can take, you know, three, four, five days, but ideally you want to do it as quickly as possible. And when you get a sexual harassment complaint, it's pretty much drop everything and do this for the next couple of days. And then you need to reach a conclusion. Um, it's a tempting in these situations because typically the harasser is going to deny it and the victim is going to say it happened. It's oftentimes popular in these situations to say, we don't know what happened. You know, it's a big mystery to us because uh, one says one thing, one says another. But again, under those circumstances, you're gonna refer to these types of credibility determinations. Yes, there are times you're gonna say you don't know, but that shouldn't be the automatic or inevitable response that you're going to give because sometimes you pretty much do know. There's outside corroboration in the story, or it's pretty clear this person had some evil intention, um, and so you want to make sure that, that you, are, uh, you are not scared of making a finding one way or the other. And then everyone needs to be retrained in the policy. Um, the victim, if she, he or she's a victim, the alleged harasser, if he or she's a, uh, you know, even if you find that nothing happened, or it happened exactly the way the victim said. Even witnesses to the situation should be retrained. The only time you don't retrain the harasser is when you're gonna dismiss the harasser. Um, and so under those circumstances, you also need to have a consequence. Again, um, everybody gets retrained even if you find there was no substance to it. But if there is some substance, there needs to be some consequence. Um, it doesn't have to be dismissal under uh, a local dismissal. Certainly it should be a tool in, in the arsenal, of the HR department. Um, and then you need to touch base periodically with the alleged victim, even if you found that there was no merit to the alleged victim's case, because he or she can still be subject to retaliation. And so it's good to calendar, in fact, I would recommend you calendar this through the HR professional uh, on the day that you had that conversation with the victim and calendar something a week or two out and then a month out and then six months out uh, where you touch base with this person confidentially not in front of other people uh, where you say hey how's everything going are there continuing problems and giving them the opportunity to say the harassment has continued and or retaliation or what you hope to hear is no everything's great 
And you, of course, document. If you're the HR professional, you document those conversations. Um, and of course, if there's additional reason to reopen the investigation, then you reopen the investigation at that time. So the effective prevention policy is a pretty involved thing where you're really looking at three steps, education, complaint process, and resolution. And all of those parts need to be in working order in order to have an effective prevention policy. If the employer doesn't have an effective prevention policy, Farragher Ellis is not available to the employer. So this is non-negotiable. You have to have this and you can't just have it on paper. It has to be a living, breathing process that uh, is uh, applied when it needs to be. And then finally, the, the, the plaintiff has to unreasonably fail to use it. Um, here the, the plaintiff did not reach out and contact the, uh, uh, the, the, the right people to, to make the complaint. Now, of course, if the plaintiff did do that, then um, you're able to investigate it, uh, resolve the issue promptly. The, the program worked, but um, you know, obviously in that situation, you were able to, to end the problem before it became a problem. It was just in the very beginning stages, a couple of dirty jokes were told, nobody was hurt. The plaintiff said, or the person said, hey, you know, I don't like this. Oh, okay, let's reinvestigate it. Okay, stop telling those jokes. Oh, okay, I got it. Everybody's happy. Uh, it's only when it is allowed to fester and continue that the hostile work environment really becomes an issue. So here's the scenario. Bob is a maintenance worker. He is romantically attracted to Mary, who also works there. Mary has no interest in Bob, but Bob stalks her in the workplace. How Bob's, however, careful to keep his behavior hidden from everyone except for Mary. And this is, unfortunately, a pretty common uh, scenario for harassers. Uh, Mary doesn't bring up this complaint, but she decides to quit her job and she files a sexual harassment claim against the club. Under these circumstances, the, 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 the business can avoid liability if it can show that it had that effective uh, prevention policy and Mary refused to avail herself of it. It doesn't appear that, Bob, that Mary reported to Bob, um, and so there doesn't seem to be any kind of quid pro quo possibility going on. So it doesn't look like Mary's actions were a reasonable response. There was no need for her to quit before she actually made her complaint. So Bob is the head of the quality control department. He propositions Mary. She works in uh, the, the department. Um, uh, after Mary declines, um, Bob starts finding fault with her work. That's his job and then he is able to get her demoted. Well, now we have a tangible job action. It doesn't really matter what kind of effective um, prevention policy this employer has because we're in quid pro quo territory now. Now, um, if Mary had complained back here when Bob was finding fault, then the company had the opportunity to jump on it because at that point there hadn't been intangible job action. Um, and so, again, having the effective uh, complaint process can be beneficial in that it can stop the process that leads to the tangible job action. But once the tangible job action happens, the employer is going to be on the hook. Um, Mary reasonably believes if she complains about Bob to the company management, management will take no action against Bob because of his reputation with senior management. This is an argument that the victim can assert that, you know, well, Bob's the CEO of the company or Bob's uh, the, the, the brother-in-law of the CEO of the company, or, uh, you know, Bob is constantly having, you know, drinks and playing golf and doing stuff with senior management. Um, that's going to be somewhat difficult for Mary to prove um, that, you know, she reasonably failed to, that, uh, to do that. Um, but, but again, um, this is one of those elements. Now, I mean, ultimately, it's the job of the employer, excuse me, the employer to prove that the plaintiff unreasonably failed to use it, that it would have been a reasonable approach. It'll ultimately go to the jury, but obviously this is another reason um, that uh, HR and line management probably shouldn't be too chummy, because this can provide an avenue for 
uh, plaintiff to allege that it would have been unreasonable to require that she use that mechanism. Though Fox Industry has a sexual harassment policy in place, Mary doesn't use it. Again, because it's a quid pro quo situation, Fox Industries uh, can't rely upon the sexual harassment policy. Now, even in a quid pro quo situation, Fox Industries is still gonna be benefited by having the policy because certainly things like punitive damages and things like that are gonna be less likely if Fox Industries does have an effective sexual harassment policy, has an effective complaint policy. And so even in a quid pro quo case, that policy, that Farragher-Ellerth defense can still at least reduce some damages. Now we've been talking as if the harasser is always the boss, and certainly the harasser can be the boss, but it can also be a coworker. We've also talked about that pretty regularly, but the scenario we haven't really talked about is when the harasser is a customer or a, a third party. Uh, you may recall we had this scenario involving Mary, who was a Filipino nurse in a nursing home, and Bob, uh, who was a patient in a nursing home, and Bob would make uh, offensive comments about Mary's national origin. Um, in that situation, Bob was kind of the equivalent of a customer. He was a patient in the nursing home. Um, and we talked about how the employers can't effectively say to Mary, well, you know, we can't control Bob, Bob's a customer. That isn't a successful excuse for letting Mary or anyone else to be subject to a type of discrimination or harassment. That also applies to third parties. Um, and um, uh, the, the employer is going to be liable if it knew about the acts of harassment but failed to take appropriate corrective action. So it needs to address the issue with the customer, the Bob in the situation, or the third party, or maybe the third party's uh, employer. Let's consider some scenarios here. So Mary works in a warehouse. Bob is a truck driver working for a logistics company that supplies, um, you know, that transports the, the product of the, of the warehouse. Bob makes lewd remarks and asks for sexual favors whenever he sees Mary. Um, she indicates she doesn't want this behavior to continue, but he continues it. Mary complains to her supervisor. She, she is using the mechanism, the farragher ellerth mechanism that Koala Bear has. But what does the supervisor say? Is nope, not the company's policy because Bob doesn't work for us. Bob is a third party in this scenario. So therefore, Bob, does, or excuse me, the, the company where Mary works doesn't address the issue. Under these scenario, the scenario, the employer is going to be strictly liable for the harassment because Bob is a third party, in this case, not a coworker, but a third party. So what should the supervisor have done? Well, the supervisor should have alerted someone in HR about the concern, and then an investigation ought to have been launched. The HR person is not gonna to talk to Bob directly, but is going to let Bob's employer, we'll say it's UPS, know about the concern and see how UPS wants to follow up on that. UPS may want to get Bob's statement. UPS may say, no, you can talk to Bob. Um, a lot of employers don't want to talk directly to Bob because they don't want to get into a joint employer situation. But whatever the mechanism is, we need to understand Bob's version of the incident. We need to obviously get Mary's version. And very likely there may be other people in the facility who can confirm or dispute what Mary is saying. There may also be video cameras or other indications that would point to this type of issue. Um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to move Mary to a different part of the facility. A better approach would be to move Bob. Maybe Bob typically works at a certain um, loading dock that has been assigned to Mary. Maybe Mary works with loading dock three. Well, Bob may move, be moved to loading dock seven during the course of the investigation so that we can decide what's going on. It's a a best practice not to remove the harass, harassed victim, or at least the alleged harassed victim, um, unless she or he wants to be moved. Moving the alleged harasser, especially temporarily, is not a problem from a legal standpoint, um, unless it's obvious in the circumstances this is a made up complaint. You don't have to remove Bob, but you definitely ought to make sure that both parties understand 
that they ought not be interacting together except when strictly necessary for the, because of the nature of the work. Okay, obviously Farragher and Ellerth are U.S. Supreme Court decisions, and they held that employers can be vicariously liable. And again, let's just reflect on our other two words for this, respondeat superior and strictly liable. And as we said, that they can be liable for the unlawful sexual harassment of employees by company supervisors. And again, the, the goal here is to, in, is, the reason this liability exists is so that employers um, are motivated to train and to monitor the behaviors of their supervisors. So an employer is gonna be strictly liable for quid pro quo um, harassment really by anyone um, or quid pro quo discrimination by a supervisor. In other words, the Farragher Ellis defense is not available in quid pro quo situations. It's only in the hostile work environment situation that it arises. So here we have our summary about Farragher. Um, and again, we see the date here. This case has been around for a while, back in 1998. This is a really important case. You need to know its names, its facts, its significance, its holding. Now we talk about this as a sexual harassment case and it absolutely is that. But the same logic that we see in Farragher and Ellerth applies to any type of harassment, hostile work environment harassment claim, including ones that relate to racial harassment, national origin harassment, religious harassment, age harassment, you name the type of harassment. Obviously the facts are gonna be somewhat different, but the, the defense is available. So when you're crafting your Farragher Ellerth defense, your policy, you wanna make sure you open it up so it includes not just sexual harassment, but any other type of, of harassment type theory. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, 90 plus percent of your actual harassment cases are gonna be sexual harassment, but you don't wanna limit it to that situation. So let's see what the issue is raised in Farragher. Will an employer be liable for the actions of an employee whose sexual harassment of subordinates has created a hostile work environment? And yes, that is true, it will be usually, except we do have the possibility of an affirmative defense. You can see that even when the supervisor is the one engaging in the hostile work environment, the affirmative defense is still available. It's only when we're in the quid pro quo area that there is no affirmative defense available. Now, when the, har when the harasser in the hostile work environment situation is a supervisor, it's going to be more possible for the employee to say it was unreasonable for the employee to think that filing a complaint would be effective. So it is harder to make a farragher ellerth defense, affirmative defense, if the uh, hostile work environment creator is a supervisor, but it's not impossible. So let's look at the facts briefly. So uh, Farragher resigned from her position as a lifeguard. She brings a suit, their, their supervisor sexually, create a sexually hostile work environment by their touching, by their remarks and their comments. I'm not sure what their remarks and comments are, but clearly when I was writing in, I wasn't being as precise with my language as I should have been. Okay, so we know that uh, the uh, US Supreme Court has said that the employer is gonna be vicariously liable for the actionable discrimination caused by the supervisor. That's the standard, that's the rule. But we do have the option uh, again, if the defendant can prove it, of asserting an affirmative defense. And that is, was there an effective, let's go back here so you can see the elements of the affirmative defense. Uh, was there an effective prevention policy in place and did the plaintiff unreasonably fail to use it? Okay, and here we have from the other part, the Ellerth uh, portion of it. Again, this is a companion case. The US Supreme Court will oftentimes accept two, it's usually two, but there can be more than two, uh, two cases uh, kind of over the same topic. Um, and the reason that they do that is so they can uh, flesh out some of the subtleties of their analysis. Because again, their case, their, their opinion ought to just talk about the cases that they are in fact lit litigating. 
And so if you have the companion cases, it allows there to be more granularity, more precision in the opinion. And as we saw before, when we were looking at um, Meritor versus um, Harris, um, that um, there was a, a, a several year gap between the first case and the case that kind of set the standard. Well, you can see if there had been two cases at the same time that the US Supreme Court had had at the same time that they had had the Meritor Savings case, then they could have maybe uh, protected um, employers and plaintiffs from a lot of uncertainty that lasted for years and years. So the companion case method is a smart one. Uh, the court does not always do it by any means, but in this case it did, and it was probably a good decision on its part to do so. Um, so what the Ellerth decision did, which of course is consistent with the Farragher decision, it said that the harassed employee, um, because the harassed employee has not suffered any job-related consequences, so there's no quid pro quo, the employer can defend itself by showing it quickly acted to prevent and correct any harassing behavior, and the harassed employee un unreasonably failed to use that mechanism. So here are our two steps that we were looking at earlier. And again, we don't have this affirmative action defense when it uh, results in an actual tangible job action when there is a quid pro quo. Let's consider the scenario. So Mary works in a, a place, she's the only female, and she's referred to as Sexy Mary by her uh, male colleagues. Uh, sometimes they leave new pictures, send her vulgar emails, follow her into the restroom. Okay, that's pretty scary. Um, Bob tries to get physically intimate with her one day at work, so Mary complains with the head of HR. A head of HR, sounds like a really awesome manager here, says the guys are just having some fun. She needs to be a good sport. Under these circumstances, it's possible that uh, this company actually did have an effective uh, uh, complaint process, but of course the HR manager didn't follow it. Uh, Mary have tried to avail, your, avail herself of it, but obviously it wasn't successful. So under these circumstances, unfortunately the distillery is gonna be out of luck. So Bob is the branch manager, the big boss of a particular bank, and he hires Mary as a teller. So there's a reporting relationship here. A few months later, he wants her to have sex with him. In return for a promotion, Mary agrees. Um, after um, having sex with him for a while, she tells him it's over and she applies for a, pro a promotion and he um, gives the job to somebody else who has less experience. This is the tangible job action. So now we're in quid pro quo territory. Up to this point, we're probably in the hostile work environment scenario. Now let me pause here and say that, let's say that Bob had actually selected somebody who had more experience than Mary. Well, then we wouldn't be in a tangible job action situation necessarily. I mean, it would become a, a matter of evidence, um, you know, just for the jury to decide. But, you know, obviously uh, Bob may well not be uh, discriminating or excuse me, harassing her or retaliating against her in any way. It just may be that, you know, she doesn't have as much experience or she doesn't have the right kind of experience or her job performance hasn't been as, as positive as this other person's. But if it appears that this person is a less strong candidate than Mary, then we absolutely do have uh, uh, a quid pro quo. In spite of the well-developed sexual harassment policy, um, Mary doesn't avail herself of that. But it doesn't matter because this is a quid pro quo situation. And so Mary doesn't have to complain, doesn't have to use the um, complaint process in a quid pro quo scenario. Of course, Mary could, and if Mary had made the complaint, it could be that the HR department might have stepped in and uh, put Mary into her position and probably fired Bob. And that would have probably been a better solution for both Mary and the bank. But Mary doesn't have to use that mechanism. It's just one option available to her. So let's consider what the fallout from uh, the Farragher LF is. What should employers do as a result of having the availability of this defense? Well, first of all, the employer needs to train all employees regarding the policy. It should be at the beginning of the employment, ideally the first day, but certainly the first week, and it should be periodically repeated. 
It's also a good idea to put this in employee communications like handbooks and things along those lines. Um, a good rule of thumb in the HR function is if you don't document it, it's like it never happened. So you need to figure out a way to record the attendance of people at this training. A lot of times these days the training is an electronic tool and so you do have an electronic record. If you happen to choose face to face, you need to make sure you have these attendance records. Somebody keeps them in a safe place so they can be accessed. Um, another thing for employers to think about is using some kind of alternative dispute, dispute resolution tool. Um, ADR, so you want to see what this is called, and these can resolve these types of disputes. Um, we've talked about ADR in other contexts. They obviously can resolve employment discrimination matters more generally. Now, it is my experience that employers don't have so many of these types of complaints that you need to have a separate system just for um, sexual harassment type concerns. Um, if you happen to be having that many of those concerns, uh, you have other problems that you need to address in terms of corporate culture. Um, but certainly ADR in any type of employment area uh, can be a good tool for uh, reducing some of the tensions in the workplace and resolving um, issues in a positive way that may preserve relationships and result in a better outcome. And you need to have at least a two-prong approach. This is good to have on posters around the facilities and certainly in the employee handbook. At least two approaches, um, uh, two methods to reporting it. So when the complaint arrives, employers need to be prompt and respectful. Only The only people who ought to know about the sexual harassment complaint are those who need to know. And that's going to be, obviously, the alleged harasser the person who received the complaint, the person who's investigating it, who may or may not be the person who received the complaint, the victim or alleged victim is obviously going to know, and there may well be other people that need to know. For example, if you're needing to pull emails, well, you may need to talk to someone in IT, but you don't need to tell them why you need this documentation. You may need to interview other people who may have been present for certain conversations, but again, uh, those people only need to know what they need to know. They don't need to know the whole scope of the situation. Um, sometimes employees in these situations will say, well, can you keep this confidential? You know, I have this complaint, but I don't want anyone to know. That's not possible. Um, the, the alleged harasser is entitled to uh, know what the complaints are against him or her and respond to those complaints. And so if the manager knows who made the complaint, it's really not possible to shield that information from the alleged harasser. Um, I'm not going to say it's impossible in every case, but certainly that would be a rare circumstance. Um, after all, if the harassment really is happening, then the harasser is going to know. <laughs> you know, I mean, unless the harasser is harassing like 50 people at the same time, uh, presumably, uh, the harasser is going to be able to put two and two together. Sometimes complaints would be anonymous, though, again, through that 1-800 number, or it could be through a dummy email that you get the complaint, or it could be a letter left in somebody's office or shoved under a door. Uh, those complaints need to be taken seriously. Now, you shouldn't assume that because it's anonymous that it must be um, not something that is accurate. Um, also, uh, the complainer is not always the victim. It can be somebody who's observed the situation and is concerned about it. And so uh, sometimes uh, that person is the hero in the story. Um, the employer, the investigator needs to make findings. You need to have a, a, a period to the end of the investigation. You need to close it down and have an end. Um, if, the, if you conclude that the, um, the alleged harasser did violate the employer's policies, then there needs to be a consequence. If you're not sure and you, you know, kind of give a, a wishy-washy conclusion, which sometimes you need to do, uh, you need to make sure that the, the consequences of further violations are communicated clearly to the harasser. And as I said before, you need to periodically uh, touch base with the complainer. And if the complainer is different than the victim, you would also do this with the victim and document those follow-ups. Really important steps.
Um, the remedy should stop the harassment and any other inappropriate contact uh, conduct, but it shouldn't be out of proportion to the act. Uh, one dirty joke probably shouldn't result in dismissal unless this person was already on some kind of corrective action plan or something like that. Um, so it needs to be proportionate. Um, if you uh, decide that you have a zero tolerance policy and you apply that policy consistently, yes, you can fire people because after all, we're in an at-will employment situation. But you have to be consistent because the alleged harasser can also file a claim Let's say um, Bob is the alleged harasser. You conclude that he did whatever the action is and you fire Bob. Bob is African-American. Uh, three weeks later, Ted, who is white, um, supposedly harasses somebody. You conclude he did it and you don't fire Ted. Well, now Bob can allege race discrimination because um, he was dismissed and Ted wasn't. So. And it isn't a situation where you kind of have the right to do whatever you want to with the alleged harasser. It does need to be proportionate, at least in terms of how you've treated other folks who have engaged in the same behavior. Also, the, your findings of your investigation need to make sense. You know, if, it, if, if you find that, that Bob harassed, but you find that Ted didn't, well, is that because the investigator had certain preconceived notions about African-American men? either that they were more likely to be dishonest or more likely to harass. And so you have to make sure that if you conclude that, Ted, that Bob harassed and maybe Ted didn't, that you have, you explain how you reached that conclusion. What was the facts that made you conclude that Bob was guilty and Ted wasn't? And you want to be sure that you don't say something as simple as, well, Ted was more credible than Bob. Well, what about Ted was more credible than Bob? Because uh, the jury might conclude, well, the only reason you think Ted was more credible is because Ted is Caucasian and Bob is African American. So you have to parse it as much as possible to objective facts. Again, you're not going to want to move the victim unless the victim wants to be moved, because that act can be considered retaliation. So Mary sees her supervisor, Bob, acting out with Anna. Later, she asks Anna and discovers that Bob has been uh, you know, engaging in this behavior with Anna pretty regularly, but Anna doesn't want to lose her job, so she doesn't want to report it. Under these situations, Mary, even though Mary hasn't been harassed at all, uh, should notify the HR department about this concern. Um, if Bob ultimately does fire Anna, um, then um, obviously Anna can file a complaint of sexual harassment or retaliation with the EOC, but Mary can do so as well. Here's another scenario. Mary worked as a nutritionist. At work, she's constantly subjected to her manager's sexual gestures and comments. Uh, Mary quits her job instead of using the complaint process. Um, Mary files a sexual harassment complaint against their employer. But the employer can use the fair girl as affirmative defense because there was no quid pro quo. There was no tangible job action. So if the employer can prove the fair girl as affirmative defense, the employer can avoid strict liability. Now, of course, just to be clear, the manager, this person, will call this person Bob. He can be sued. Mary can still sue Bob even if Mary can't successfully sue her employer. Most of the time, this isn't very effective because usually the bobs of this world, the, the supervisor, um, aren't wealthy people. And so there really isn't a deep pocket for Mary to access in terms of a lawsuit. So if Mary can't successfully sue the employer, the, the legal entity that employs both she and Bob, then most of the time it's not gonna be worth her effort to try to um, uh, sue the individual harassing person, but obviously she always has that opportunity to do so. Let's consider um, changes to logging. I don't require for this course that you know what parts of Title VII uh, came into existence in the Civil Rights Act of 1991 and what parts were always part of Title VII. I don't require that you know the distinction because after all, 1991 was a long time ago and there aren't going to be any claims percolating out there from before 1990. But just so you'll know from a point of reference, 
is uh, that the Civil Rights Act of 1991 had several major changes to Title VII, but the two that we're focusing on right here is that after this law was passed in 1991, employees for the first time was that were able to get compensatory damages and punitive damages from the employers. Um, before that, they were really just entitled to back pay, front pay, and reinstatement. Compensatory damages are things like kind of the mental anguish E-type damages. As you can imagine, losing your job can be devastating emotionally, financially, you can lose your house. And this gives a mechanism that allows um, that person to recoup some of that money, which, which may ultimately be, end up being more than uh, the amount of lost wages. And then, of course, punitive damages would be in addition to that. While uh, Title VII does permit both compensatory and punitive damages, it does cap them um, at $300,000. And that's both of them combined. Now, juries aren't told about the $300,000 cap. So a jury might well award 500,000 in compensatories and you know a million dollars in um, punitives. And the, what the court will do is uh, reduce these total to $300,000 in this case. And actually $300,000 is for the very largest of employers. If it's a smaller employer, the amount the cap will be significantly less than $300,000. Um, another thing that the Civil Rights Act of 1991 granted to plaintiffs, and not just, and this, this by the way, is not just for sexual harassment, this is for all Title VII claims. Uh, but prior to 1991, cases were not tried to a jury, but were tried to a judge in a bench trial situation. But after this uh, amendment to Title VII, we did have jury trials, um, and we still do have jury trials for all type of Title VII cases. It does require, as all jury trials require, it does require that the plaintiff or the defendant request it, but the plaintiff almost always requests request a jury trial. Um, the thought process is that juries are much more likely to side with plaintiffs and are much more likely to give us more money to plaintiffs if the plaintiff is successful. Um, uh, uh, we already talked about ADR as a common mechanism for resolving all types of employment cases. Uh, the EOC is going to recommend or request that parties use alternative dispute resolutions. A case is relatively rarely go to trial in this case, um, and that's really because neither party wants to go to trial. These cases are embarrassing for everyone, for the victim, for the alleged harasser, for the company. Um, and so as a result, it usually makes sense to resolve this or settle the case before going to trial. Uh, one thing I didn't touch on, I don't know if I missed it in the slides or not, but let me go back. Um, to the corrective action. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, smart employers do in this area is, okay, they've concluded their investigation and um, they say to, let's say they've concluded that the harasser did behave inappropriately. And so they are documenting some kind of corrective action, maybe termination, it may be a warning, it may be suspension, whatever it is. It is a best practice not to say in the document, you know, you sexually harassed Mary. The reason you don't want to say that is because that is a legal conclusion. And so if Mary does ultimately sue the employer uh, for Bob's actions, then the employer, then the employer's termination or whatever the corrective action with Bob was, is going to be an exhibited trial. And so Mary can say, look, jury, even the employer agrees that I was sexually harassed. So now this case is just about damages. So please give me lots of money. And the jury will likely find that argument compelling. So typically what an employer does is say that Bob violated company policy or, and or Bob behaved inappropriately. There's really no reason that the employer has to reach the legal conclusion about whether sexual harassment actually happened or not. Because typically employers' policy in this area is more restrictive than sexual harassment law is. Remember we talked about how um, workers can be real jerks and still it may not meet the threshold of sexual harassment. 
Well, it may not meet the threshold of sexual harassment, but I would hope that employers would prohibit offensive conduct, even if it doesn't reach that threshold, because it's destructive of work relationships and it's a waste of company resources and time. So no, one dirty joke isn't gonna be sexual harassment, but why would an employer allow a single dirty joke? It doesn't make any sense. It's not a productive use of time. And so typically an employer's policy is going to be significantly more requiring of employees than just what the law says about sexual harassment. And so when the, um, em employee, when the alleged harasser violates the company policy, MP may or may not have actually engaged in sexual harassment. And so what the issue is that the employer ought to establish is, did this employee, viol employee, employee violate the company's policy? And um, then if Mary sues for sexual harassment in those situations, the employer can say, look, Bob violated our policy, but he didn't commit sexual harassment. His behavior was somewhere between sexual harassment and where our policy was. And so therefore you can still find, even though Bob was fired or given some other corrective action, you, you the jury can still find that, that Bob did not sexually harass Mary. That's an important distinction uh, to work through as you are drafting uh, the documentation in this case. And this also ought to appear in the findings of the investigation. You don't want to use the term sexual harassment. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, so we've com completed talking about employer liability. Now we're going to talk about tort and criminal claims, how these play a role in the sexual harassment area. We've talked about tort claims before. Tort claims are not statutory as a general rule. They certainly aren't statutory in Texas. Uh, so we're not going to be looking at a statute here. These are part of the common law. Um, they've existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. And two very common tort claims are assault and battery. Um, assault is the apprehension of unwanted touching. So this is, um, assault does not actually require that touching occur. Now, in everyday conversation, if we say, he assaulted me, certainly touching is involved in the everyday meaning of that term. But when we're talking about the tort of assault, there doesn't need to actually be touching. It just has to be that the person was made to feel that touching was about to happen. So for example, if Bob, is, if, let's say Mary's in the elevator, Bob gets on the elevator with Mary, and he gets very close to Mary and kind of crowds her into the corner, he doesn't actually touch her, but Mary is in a very uh, intimidated position. That could be assault. Now, of course, battery was when actual touching happens. It's important to keep in mind that when we, we hear the term batter or battery, we think about bruises or broken bones, and certainly those would count as batteries. But battery doesn't require physical injury or pain. It just means unwanted touching. So somebody reaching over and massaging a person's shoulder. Again, not so hard to leave bruises or, or to hurt, but that is still a type of battery if it was unwanted. Now the way I keep assault and battery straight is alphabetically. A comes before B, assault comes before battery. So the person gets really close um, to the person before touching you, you can't, it's very difficult to batter somebody if you haven't first assaulted them. I suppose a person could be asleep and so they don't know that they're about to be touched until they are touched. But generally speaking, if a person is conscious, they know they're about to be touched before they actually are touched. So the assault part happens before the battery part. These are very common tort claims. Now these terms, assault and battery, are also criminal law claims. The terms in the criminal law context have different meanings. This isn't a criminal law course, so we're not gonna talk about those. Um, but uh, certainly the uh, plaintiff can certainly press criminal charges of assault and battery in addition to civilly suing for assault and battery. I've listed three other torts that are possible claims that the plaintiff can advance. One is intentional infliction of emotional distress. Um, this is a, a common tort theory. Um, it's somewhat difficult to prove, but it's, it's certainly one that almost, if you're gonna assert assault and battery, you're almost certainly gonna assert intentional infliction of emotional distress. 
And this would be when you when the person is made to feel very, very uncomfortable, uh, very distressful. I'll give you an extreme example that is in the sexual harassment area. If I were to tell you with a completely straight face, I'm so sorry to tell you that your 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 parents just died in a terrible car accident. And you believe me, and I say it in a way that's credible. And then, you know, five minutes later, I say, April Fools! Well, I intended to cause you great emotional distress. So that would be an example of intentional infliction of emotional distress. And certainly somebody who um, uh, sexually harasses somebody typically intends to. Now, whether they intended to inflict emotional distress uh, might be a, a, an issue, but, but they did intend a particular action. And so this can be a reasonable interpretation. False imprisonment also often arises in assault and battery cases. Uh, we think about imprisonment being, you know, locked away in you know, somewhere in Huntsville, for example. But imprisonment actually isn't restricted to actually being behind a locked prison door. Um, somebody can be imprisoned simply when they feel they can't safely leave a particular area. So in my example where Bob crowds Mary into the corner of the elevator and blocks her leaving, that is an example of false imprisonment, even if it only lasted until the elevator doors opened. So that's a very brief period of imprisonment, so I could see that a jury might not buy that. But the overall idea of it doesn't have to be, you know, you're locked in a room where you can't get out or something along those lines. Another possible theory is intentional interference with contractual relations. Um, a benefit to tort cases is that we have unlimited compensatory and punitive damages. We also have the ability to use jury trials in this situation. So we aren't facing this cap of $300,000. So if the jury awards $500,000 for compensatories in the tort claim, and a million dollars for punitive damages in the tort claim, then very possibly the plaintiff actually gets $1.5 million. So you can see why tort claims are very powerful tools for the plaintiff to use in his or her case. Let's consider this scenario. So Mary is a nurse. Um, this particular animal clinic has a lot of employees, so it, it is covered by Title VII. During one of her night shifts, Bob, a coworker, follows her to the parking lot, stands very close to her and touches her inappropriately. So here we have the assault and now we have the battery. Under these situations, a Mary can press civil charges against Bob for assault and battery. Uh, possibly against the Frisco Animal Clinic too, we would need more information about that. There's not here to be any quid pro quo yet. Um, so it doesn't look like Frisco Animal Clinic would be in a position to do that, but um, certainly, uh, uh, you know, if the Frisco Animal Clinic doesn't have a ferret or other defense available to it, possibly so. Um, the Mary may be able to advance claims against it as well. So let's talk about criminal liability. Certainly, uh, rape situations happen in the workplace from time to time, and those are crimes as they would be anywhere else. Um, uh, crim uh, businesses are unlikely to be guilty of uh, crimes along those situations. They might be civilly responsible, but it's really going to be the individual who raped or sexually assaulted somebody who's going to be criminally responsible under those circumstances. Um, if the harasser is found guilty of the particular crime, the victim isn't going to get any financial relief through the criminal justice system but the victim can civilly sue and use that criminal conviction as very powerful evidence uh, to um, uh, likely increase the uh, verdict that he or she will get in the civil case. Um, here are common theories for how uh, the criminal charges might advance. It can be rape, a sexual assault, assault, a battery, and there's, you know, aggravated rape, aggravated sexual assault. Um, there can be lots of different um, allegations here. It's really up to the district attorney to decide how that particular place, case will be pled. The victim doesn't decide whether it's an assault case or a battery case. 
Obviously, the specific requirements of these particular crimes are going to vary from state to state, and uh, the philosophy of the uh, district attorney might also affect how these matters are advanced. So now we've completed our topics in this course. We've talked about uh, sexual harassment generally. We talked about quid pro quo and hostile work environment. Then we talked about Farragher and Ellerth and how those cases create an affirmative defense for an employer and what that means for the employer in terms of how he or she, or how it, I guess, should handle a sexual harassment and other harassment type situations that might occur in the workplace. And then we talked about tort and criminal claims. Tort and criminal claims are especially important in harassment cases, at least sometimes are important in other Title VII type cases, but certainly they are of, of very significance, very great significance in harassment cases. So let's look at some management tips uh, that we uh, may have uh, gleaned from what we've talked about. So it's really important to have an anti-sexual harassment policy, and again, your policy you're going to want to be broader than just sexual harassment. You want to have an anti-harassment policy generally. And perhaps most important, you want to follow it. You need to have your managers and your supervisors be true believers in it. Then there needs to be a culture within the organization that a sexual harassment and even titillating or flirtatious behavior is just not okay. And leaders in the company need to model that behavior. Um, if leaders are swearing or they're using off-color comments, um, then people down the line are going to feel like that's okay for them to do, and then they might do a little bit more. And so you need to create that environment where that's just not even a possibility. Nobody even feels that that would ever happen, that we'd ever have sexual harassment. And you want to be sure that everyone knows how to effectively report uh, harassment type situations, consider posters, putting them in handbooks, having them be part of the annual training. And also just make sure there's open communication. Uh, people are going to be willing to make complaints when they feel that it's a safe environment to make complaints. And one of the ways to do that is to have an open door policy where people feel like, hey, I've got a concern. I can talk to my boss or my boss's boss about that. This is a safe place. And so uh, that involves uh, having people who are approachable, who uh, um, there's a, a, a philosophy, walk, uh, manage by walking around, manage by walking around. The idea being, you gotta know people. You gotta see people, not just in the crisis situations, but in the everyday world. You ought to know that Bob just got married. Oh, hey Bob, how's, how's married life treating you? You ought to know that Sally just you know, adopted a child. Hey, congratulations on that, Sally. How's, how's the baby doing? Or, you know, whatever the situation is. You know people, you have a comfortable relationship with people. And uh, that can uh, make it much more comfortable for the Bobs inside of the world to uh, raise concerns when they do happen. You need to take all complaints seriously. Just because that person has a reputation for being a troublemaker doesn't mean the sexual harassment didn't happen. You need to have that prompt within 24 hours harassment. Uh, you need to uh, limit information to just those who need to know. You need to make sure that the consequences are proportionate. I guess this is where I talk about, you don't want to use the term harassment um, uh, because that's a legal term. So that's what I was talking about before that can find. You want to follow up with the victims and the complainers to make sure the problem has not reoccurred. It's also probably not a good idea to talk to the alleged harasser. Hey Bob, again, confidentially, respectfully, hey Bob, just wanted to touch base with you, make sure everything's going okay. Um, you know, just wanna make sure that you're, you're still on board with our policy on sexual harassment and document those conversations. Watch out, especially in male-dominated jobs, that there is an anti-female animus, and certainly in female-dominated jobs, there can be anti-male animus, and that's equally unacceptable. And of course, you wanna have a work workplace that is friendly, that is open, and that is professional. And uh, that is some of your best protection against sexual harassment. Um, thank you so much for following this presentation. I hope that it's been helpful for you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to um, um, contact me, reach out to me. I'd be glad to talk to you in more detail about this. Thanks for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.